Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I'm an ex Navy SEAL. Here's why I retired. I was a Navy SEAL, BUD S Class 237, and assigned to SEAL Team 10. I enlisted in the Navy after dropping out of college. I realized it just wasn't for me. Going to college, getting my degree, and working some 9 to 5 job for the rest of my life. I felt like I was meant for something. More. My parents weren't happy when I told them I had quit college, and planned on becoming a Navy SEAL. Looking back on it, I probably should have pushed through my last two years of college so I could have at least had a degree to fall back on in case things didn't work out. I made it through training, and let me tell you that was one of the hardest things I have ever had to do, and eventually earned my SEAL Trident. I remember the day like it was yesterday. Seaman Dakota Waters, please step forward, said my SQT instructor. He smiled, pinned on my Trident, and we saluted each other. And that was that, I was officially a Navy SEAL. Everyone clapped, including my parents who were there, and had grown to accept my decision. The moment was surreal. So much hard work, finally paying off. Within a month, I was shipped out to Afghanistan for my first tour. After my first tour I found a girlfriend, Mary, who I eventually married. During my second tour I was notified we had a little girl on the way. After three tours to all around the Middle East, I had eventually worked my way up to Chief Petty Officer. The guys on my squad, they were my brothers. I had spent more time with them than I did my own family, and we had been through hell together. One day about four months after coming home from Iraq after our third tour, me and some buddies from the team were kicking back by a bonfire at a ranch one of my buddies owned. We were having a good time, drinking beers, telling stories, laughing, and reminiscing. It was at that moment, when I received a phone call. It was our commanding officer. I thought this was odd because our commanding officer, LT Shipley, never calls us unless it's extremely urgent. I told everyone to quiet down, and I put it on speaker. Chief Petty Officer Waters, are you alone? Said Shipley on the other end of the line. Um no, I'm with the squad. Why? I replied. Good, they need to hear this too. He replied. In one week, you and your squad will be shipping out to Panama to conduct reconnaissance on illegal trade routes leading up through Central America and into the US. We all looked at each other, somewhat in shock. We had all just gotten back from deployment not four months ago, and now they are shipping us off to Panama? One of my teammates, Daniel, spoke up and said that can't be right. There are no known drug trafficking routes in southern Central America, they all start in Costa Rica. Maybe they've found new ones? And they want us to gather more information on them? My buddy Ricky said, sounding incredulous. Regardless of what exactly they want us to be looking at, it's complete bullshit we are already getting deployed again. I complained. We all thought the whole situation was very weird, but eventually we just accepted it. Just as stated, exactly a week from that day, we were on a plane being shipped out to Panama. Panama is a trashy place, no offense to anyone from there, but after what happened to me there I do not regret talking bad about the place. It's awful. The second we landed at the headquarters in the middle of the jungle where we would be living for the next two months, I knew I was gonna hate it. Humid, sticky, warm, bugs constantly buzzing around your ear, it's enough to make a bunch of hardened warriors go mad. We got to our bunks, unpacked our stuff, and relaxed. We knew it was going to be a long two months, so we needed all of the sleep we can get. Wonder what exactly they're gonna have us spying on tomorrow? Asked Johnson, our team's medic. No idea Ricky replied. That's the last thing I remember before drifting off into sleep. I was awoke in the next morning to LT Shipley banging on the side of my bunk. Everyone up. Time to go, everyone up, come on. I checked the clock on the wall above my bed, 3.42 in the morning. I rubbed my eyes, shook my head, and sat up. This damn early LT? I said irritatingly. I don't make the rules I just enforce him he replied. Everybody up, let's go. Once everyone was up, we grabbed a quick snack to give us some energy, and then headed to the briefing room to figure out what we were going to be doing. 
The briefing room was small, you could fit maybe 10 people at most in there. We were greeted by some army general, whose name I didn't know. He shook our hands and sat all four of us, myself, Ricky, Daniel, and Johnson down. All right boys, your mission is to gather as much information as you can on this tunnel we discovered about 80 clicks southeast from this point. We suspect it to be used by drug traffickers to smuggle contraband such as heroin and cocaine across the border into Mexico so the cartels can ship it to America. There is a clearing with a perfect view of the entrance to the tunnel about 600 yards where you all can remain hidden. Overall the objective is fairly simple. Watch the entrance of the tunnel, photograph what you see, make reports, and report back of anyone entering or exiting the tunnel. Got it? We all replied with yes sir. Xville will be 20 clicks over this mountain at approximately 9 pm, so don't miss it Shipley added. It was at that moment I realized that Shipley was in full combat gear. I don't know how I hadn't noticed it before. Are you going on this op with us Shipley? I asked. Oh no, I got my own op with another squad, he said. I thought that was a little weird, I thought this entire situation was weird. Ever since we had arrived things hadn't seemed right. I asked my squad if they felt the same way, and they said they did. Johnson said he had been getting weird looks from all of the higher ranking personnel since he had gotten here. He told me he even saw two Air Force women pointing at him and whispering something in each other ears. I didn't know what to make of the situation, but what could I do? My job was to execute what the higher ups told me to do. We were to load up on the helicopter in five minutes. All right boys I said. Let's load out. We collected our gear, weapons, and everything else we would have needed for this operation. The helicopter ride there was rather uneventful. 20 minutes of flying over a thick jungle, until eventually. We saw it. You could barely see it due to it being the early morning and still being dark, but it was there. It was bigger than any tunnel I had ever seen. The opening of it stood at least 90 feet tall, and looked like it had been there for centuries. The helicopter flew us right past it, about half a mile away from it until it dropped us off. The reason we get dropped off so far away from the objective is in case anyone of interest is at the location at that current moment, they will not see us. Once we were dropped off, it was a good walk to get where we were going to settle up in. Once we got there, we unpacked everything we had. Johnson had his pair of binoculars, Ricky had a zoomed in scope he attached to his long ranged rifle, Daniel had a camera and notepad, and I was on communications duty or comms as we like to call it. The first five hours were uneventful. Sitting there, with our perfect view of the entrance to the tunnel. Nothing happened, no one entered, no one left it. It was around 10.30 at this point, and the sun was up now. It was around this time when I told Ricky, Daniel, and Johnson that we should take sleeping schedules. Two of us keep watch while the other two sleep, and we would switch every three hours. We were to wake the two sleepers up if anything eventful happened. Daniel and Johnson offered to take first watch, while Ricky and I slept. I was fine with that idea, the Lord knew I needed some shut eye. I rolled out my backpack for a pillow, and slowly drifted off to sleep. Dakota. Dakota wake up. I was awoken to Johnson shaking me and yelling in my face. WH. What's going on? I asked. I then looked around, and noticed Daniel was missing. Where the hell did Daniel go? I asked. The tunnel. He walked into the tunnel. What do you mean he walked into the tunnel? Asked Ricky, who was awake at this point. It was about an hour after you two had gone to sleep, he had been completely normal, but then he just got up and started walking towards the entrance. I tried to stop him, but he just kept walking. It was almost as if he was in some kind of trance. Johnson replied. We gotta go after him I said. We were given strict orders not to enter the tunnel. Johnson replied hesitantly. That's our damn brother in there, let's go, Ricky said, grabbing his rifle and running towards the tunnel. Me and Johnson both grabbed our rifles and followed Ricky. As we got closer and closer to the tunnel I began to make out more distinct features of it. It had stalagmites and stalactites, and it didn't go straight through the mountain, it went down into it. This wasn't a tunnel. This was a cave. Wait, I said. Look at this. I don't know any drug traffickers that would use this to smuggle cocaine. Ricky and Johnson both looked as baffled as I was. 
What do we do? Asked Ricky. We can't leave Daniel down there, I said. Hope you guys like spelunking. We turned on the flashlights to our rifles, and began our descent into the cave. The first few hundred feet had nothing in them. Just dark tunnels. But about 500 feet in, we began noticing drawings on the walls. At first they were just normal caveman drawings. Pictures of tigers and leopards from thousands of years ago. But as the drawings went on, they got more confusing. The leopards and tigers were soon replaced by violent scribbles, as if someone had gotten a piece of chalk and scrubbed the walls with it as hard and spastically as they could. We kept following the scribbles along the wall, until they eventually stopped. What was drawn after the scribbles I still have not forgotten to this day. A picture. Of a person. But it wasn't a person. It had long, disgusting tentacles, and dragon-like wings. It had horns on its head, with a long lizard-like tail. But it wasn't so much the drawing of the creature that scared me, it was the drawings of the hundreds of people around it bowing to it, worshipping it. The pictures then went on to show people giving human sacrifices to this creature. There were drawings of babies being burned alive, and the burnt corpse being fed to it. It was disgusting. What the F said Ricky. Maybe it's a drawing of a deity thought to have been real by an ancient civilization Johnson replied. It was at that moment we heard Daniel scream from deep within the cave. That's Daniel. I screamed. We all rushed towards where we heard the scream, tripping and tumbling over rocks the entire way. We kept screaming things out like we're coming Daniel. Or don't worry buddy, but something in my mind kept telling me it was too late for Daniel, and if we went down there we would meet his same fate. But I couldn't leave Daniel down there, even if he was dead. He has been with me since the first day of SEAL training, he was my brother. We raced down the cave, sprinting as fast as we could until eventually we turned a corner and. Oh my god Ricky whispered. We all stood there in horror. At first I didn't exactly know what I was looking at, but then it dawned on me. It was Daniel's body, it was torn to shreds. It was almost unrecognizable and if it weren't for his dog tag I might not have been able to figure out it was him. We all stood there over what was left of his corpse, petrified with fear. I was about to say something until we heard a loud crash coming from across the what I now realized was a massive dome-like room within the cave. We all turned to look to where we had heard the crash, and what we saw makes me regret ever joining the military in the first place. That thing, that thing that was drawn on the walls of the cave. There it was, looking at us. It looked even more hideous in person. It was about 40 feet tall, jet black save for dark blood-colored eyes. It had jagged teeth, with ten long squid-like tentacles protruding from its back. It had those black dragon-like wings and a lizard-like tail just like on the drawings. Its face. My god its face. The red eyes and jagged teeth, the rotted skin, and the long black hair. I wanted to say it looked human, but this thing was far from human. It let out one raspy growl, and the walls of the cave began to shake. Then it got even worse. People, thousands of people, wearing clothing made out of bones and cloth with face and body paint all over them began closing in on us. I don't know where they came from, but there were at least 2,000 of them. We gotta get the hell out of here, I yelled. Ricky and Johnson were still petrified with fear. Let's go, I yelled at both of them. All of a sudden the creature shrieked a disgusting shriek and one of its tentacles extended a tremendously long length and wrapped around Ricky. With one swift pull Ricky went flying in the air, and into the creature's mouth. I wanted to do something, but there was no time. I yelled at Johnson to follow me, and we both began to run. I fired off a few rounds at the people chasing after us, and they fell to the ground creating a small gap for me and Johnson to run through. I sprinted through that gap, nearly getting caught by one of the people. Once I was out of the gap, I checked to see if Johnson was behind me, and he was. We both raced up the cave, trying to remember where we had come from. The last thing either of us wanted was to get lost in this hell hole with that thing. We kept sprinting, desperately making our way through the cave until we saw the light from the entrance. I quickly glanced behind me, and noticed that some of the people were still chasing after us. I grabbed a frag I had on me and tossed it at them, sending them all flying. The relief only lasted for a second though, when I heard a demonic screech come from within the cave. At that moment me and Johnson sprinted out of the cave, and kept running. 
When we were about 300 yards away from the cave, I turned around to see if we were being followed. There it was. Not following us, but standing at the entrance of the cave looking right at us. We both stared at it for about 30 seconds. It let out one last deafening screech, and then went back into the cave. Neither me or Johnson knew if it was going to come back out, but we weren't staying to find out. We resumed running, not stopping until we knew we were far away from that cave. When we finally stopped, we both found a place to rest, and we just sat there. Not saying a word. About an hour passed before Johnson finally asked what time is it. I checked my mobile clock, 8.30 p.m. Xville was in 30 minutes it. Do you remember where Xville was? I asked Johnson. Yeah, when we were running I somehow managed to keep track of where we were. Luckily for us the helicopter is supposed to arrive 5 miles west of here. He replied. I sighed with relief, and we began heading that way. When we got there, the helicopter was waiting for us. What took you all so long? We were just about to head off and leave ya. And where are the other two? The pilot asked. I just looked at him with a blank expression on my face. He just nodded, and began to take off. When we arrived back at HQ, me and Johnson were pulled into a room and sat down. Four men in suits and the general that had briefed us walked in. They had looks of pity on their faces, and one of the suited men leaned in. He sighed. Here is $100,000 each for both of you, never speak of this again. Please, he said. He slid the wads of cash to both of us from across the table, and they all filled out except for the general. The general looked at us with a sad look on his face for a minute, and then informed us that our flights home would be tomorrow, and the option for an early retirement would be presented to us. I am now a 46-year-old man, still happily married to my loving wife Mary, and the proud father of a beautiful 17-year-old daughter named Jessica. I still keep in touch with Johnson, and sometimes we get together at a bar or around a bonfire and just cry together. Cry about what we had witnessed, and for the loss of our two brothers. I will forever hold hatred towards the United States military, and the government, for willingly putting us in the situation they did. Lying to us so we wouldn't back out of the operation, and getting my two closest friends killed. When my wife asked what happened to Ricky and Daniel, I lie and say they were shot while in Afghanistan. When I wake up screaming at night from the nightmares, I tell her it was just nightmares from what happened in the Middle East. I could never tell her what actually happened, or why I was actually diagnosed with severe PTSD. I even lied to the doctors at the Virginia partially because I was informed by the government to never speak of what happened, but also because I would be deemed crazy if I ever told anyone. I couldn't keep it to myself any longer though. I had to get it off my chest. So for all of you out there, never become a Navy SEAL, never enlist in the military, and never, and I mean never journey to the Darien Gap in Panama. This is my dad's story. After he was done in Vietnam he soon stationed at an Air Force base in Greenland. They had bad blizzards often there and when they came through the base shut down and every section of the barracks would take roll call. These blizzards are intense. There were cables running between all the buildings you attached to your person with a carabiner so if there was a sudden whiteout you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 meters from shelter because they got lost in bad weather and froze. He said for about 5 months every time they locked down for weather they would hear horrendous screaming outside. Everyone was accounted for so they didn't risk sending anyone out to investigate. They wrote it off as an animal. However, every time this was heard, the engine room would be wrecked. Tools everywhere, paperwork all over the floor, tables and tool boxes knocked over, even one time a several thousand pound jet engine had been lifted from its work bench crane thing and smashed almost 30 feet away. The hangars and engine room had cameras covering every single possible entrance with spotlights that made them clear even in a whiteout. No animals, no people, no anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. Then one day it just stopped. Edit. Okay, since I have a lot of debate on what could have caused this I will clear some stuff up. This was not something they just shrugged at. It cost a lot of money and threw a wrench in at least one surveillance routine which caused a lot of brass from the DOD and the CIA to breath fire down the base commander's neck. 
This facility, beyond military function, served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. There was a full investigation using all manner of scientists, engineers, and specialists. They came up with no satisfactory explanation for what was happening. I do not believe in the paranormal nor did my father. This is the only spooky type story he is from 22 years in the service. No one knows what happened. It was very strange in every way. Hundreds of people wrote reports and documented this, it wasn't just some grease monkeys scratching their heads and randomly guessing. That said, I spoke to my mom. She told me a couple things I missed. After one of these occasions the U2 in the shop had all its electronics turned on. Many of the systems in this plane were special built for this airframe and this particular cruise mission. These systems were complex and archaic. Very few people knew how to operate this machinery and the only ones on base that could were two engineers and its crew. It wasn't a simple matter of hitting power buttons and flipping switches from off to on. Another time three barrels of hydraulic fluid vanished and were never found. They doubted the screaming noise was wind because it came in short, irregular, bursts and winds never produced those sounds again. They theorized it was a polar bear but, if it was, its coincidental timing was extremely uncanny. Lastly Control picked up a bunch of weird interference and anomalous readings that, again, had the uncanny timing of happening only when this was going on. They were never able to reproduce these errors in a controlled manner. Thank you guys for reading. Edit 2. Okay since I am still getting a stream of people saying I believe this was something supernatural or aliens or something. No. What I am saying is that the best possible explanation is a series of many unrelated, unlikely, and unreproducible events came together in an also unlikely manner that left no satisfactory explanation for what was going on. The screaming was thought to be a polar bear or something. The radar glitches were thought to be due to moisture but left no obvious signs. The barrels were most likely the result of an inventory error. Etc. However, even with this all in mind, the chances of all these events coming together, in this manner, by sheer coincidence, is astronomical. So no one was willing to say anything with certainty, thus no satisfactory answer and writing it off as an act of God. It's creepy, it's bizarre, but it's not supernatural and the answer isn't simply it's the wind. For more info see my replies to others about the construction of the place, the cameras, etc. I was working the night shift in an old SIF that was originally built back in the 50s. I was starting to feel sleepy so I went for a walk to wake myself up and ended up getting lost in the maze of underground tunnels, finding myself in a part of the complex that obviously hadn't been used in decades. Everything looked like it was just left there and forgotten one day, eerily frozen in time. I was extremely tired and stressed out from work and that really didn't help me to be able to rationally retrace my steps. Everything around me seemed like something was hiding in the shadows and watching me. It took a long time, but I finally made it back to my position and didn't tell anyone what happened. Luckily it was the night shift and no one noticed I was gone. A year later we got a new guy, and in the middle of the night shift he got up and went for a walk. A couple of hours later he came back looking like he'd seen a ghost. I just gave him a knowing nod, and he knew I knew exactly what he just went through. I'm not in the military but I did read Hal Moore's book We Were Soldiers Once. And young and there were multiple instances of North Vietnamese soldiers just walking straight up to US forces in the middle of combat. They'd look at them and they wouldn't even raise their weapon or unsling it. They would just start laughing at the US soldiers. Then the US guys would shoot them. I sure there's a reasonable explanation of why this happened. But it's pretty creepy that the enemy might just walk up to you and just start laughing in your face seemingly not caring whether you shoot them or not. I've never been one to shy away from a challenge. 20 years as a Navy SEAL taught me that much. But nothing, absolutely nothing, could have prepared me for the mission that would turn my world upside down, challenge everything I believed in, and leave me questioning the very fabric of reality. It started as a routine search and rescue operation in the Canadian wilderness. A brutal winter storm had hit, and a group of hikers had gone missing. 
Our team, seasoned in survival and combat, was airlifted into the area, ready to face the elements and bring those hikers home. The wilderness of Montreal is unforgiving in the winter. The snow blankets everything, silencing footsteps and hiding dangers. We were prepared for the cold, the isolation, and even the possibility of not finding the hikers alive. What we weren't prepared for was the horror we stumbled upon instead. Three days into the mission, we found the first body. Not just lost to the cold, but torn apart. It was a scene straight out of a nightmare, something no animal we knew could have done. That's when we heard the stories from the locals, a tale of a creature, part man, part beast, that roamed the wilderness. A Sasquatch-like entity, they said, responsible for a series of cannibalistic murders stretching back generations, always in the deepest cold of winter. Skeptical but unnerved, we pressed on, deeper into the heart of the wilderness. The snow seemed to swallow us, the vast white expanse broken only by the dark silhouettes of towering pines and the occasional blood-red splash against the pristine snow, reminders of the violence that had occurred here. Then, we saw them. At first, just shadows moving between the trees, too quick to be real. But as we ventured further, the encounters became more frequent, more tangible. We found tracks, enormous footprints unlike any animal known to man, leading us into the depths of the forest. I remember the first time I saw one, truly saw one. It was twilight, the sky a deep indigo, when a figure stepped out onto the path ahead of us. It stood on two legs, towering, covered in thick, dark fur. Its eyes, reflecting the dying light, fixed on us with an intelligence that was unmistakably human. Then, it was gone, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. Panic set in. We were trained for combat, for survival, but how do you fight a myth? How do you battle a legend that has stalked the nightmares of men for centuries? Our mission changed then. It was no longer about search and rescue, it was about survival, about getting out of those woods alive. But they were watching us, always just out of sight, always just a step behind. We could hear them at night, the low, guttural sounds they made, communicating in a language that was as ancient as the forest itself. In the end, we discovered there weren't just one or two of them. There were tribes, entire communities that had lived hidden from the world, emerging only in the deep freeze of winter when the world was silent and white. When we finally made it back to civilization, battered, frostbitten, but alive, we told our story. We spoke of the things we had seen, the horrors we had witnessed. But the government dismissed our claims, labeled our encounter the result of stress and isolation. They sent us back to the USA with a warning to keep quiet about what we had seen. But silence is not in my nature. I know what I saw, what we all saw out there in the deep wilderness of Montreal. And while the world may not be ready to believe in creatures of myth and legend, I know the truth. I've seen it with my own eyes. So, here I am, sharing my story with you. Maybe you'll believe me, maybe you won't. But if you ever find yourself in the Canadian wilderness in the dead of winter, remember my words. The world is far stranger, far more mysterious, and far more terrifying than you could ever imagine. As a Marine, I used to have the graveyard patrol shift at the Beirut Bombing Memorial. Part of the memorial is dedicated to a veteran's cemetery. Oddly enough I never got freaked out being completely alone in a remote cemetery, in the middle of the night, surrounded by dense woods on all sides. It was actually kind of peaceful, to be honest. However, one night I was patrolling near the perimeter fence where some of the oldest headstones are, when I heard the sound of a woman humming. I followed the sound and noticed a light glowing through the vines and brush of a large tree. As I approached, I could literally feel my hair beginning to lift as if there was an electric current in the air. I pushed aside the brush and what I saw nearly took my breath away. It was an old, weathered headstone with a large cross etched into the marble. Only the cross was glowing a bright, vivid blue, like a neon bulb. The humming was also suddenly much louder and had a weird plurality to it, like it was coming from hundreds of voices at once. Needless to say, I freaked the F out. I screamed like a scared little girl and sprinted back to the parking lot. I radioed the guard who was supposed to relieve me and forced him to come early, 
then spent the rest of my shift in the cab of his truck. I don't think he believed me, but he stayed in his truck and didn't go out on patrol until the sun was fully up. A few days later, I worked up the nerve to return to the grave, during the day, of course. As I suspected, in the light of day it was a completely mundane headstone. There was no name, only the aforementioned cross. I ran my hands over the stone and checked to see if maybe there was some sort of hidden light source or solar panel, but no, it was just plain, solid, unremarkable stone. The humming was gone, too. I eventually returned to my normal shift, but never again experienced anything out of the ordinary. I never learned whose grave that was, either, but I find myself thinking about it from time to time. It certainly sounds absurd when I say it out loud, and I suppose it could have been a hallucination or a trick of my tired brain, but I don't believe it was. I think it was real, a ghost or spirit of some sort, but I don't think it was malevolent at all. I was part of a military group tasked with rescuing a woman held hostage in Mexico. We faced something demonic down there. It's an old superstition amongst veterans that your last mission is the unluckiest. I believe it. When I reread the following excerpts from my journal it is evident. The completion of my most lucrative but bloodiest outing was uncanny. I have changed all the names. Most of you will refuse to believe my tale. I know what happened, and I need to share my story. I was digging a grave. The Sierra Nevada mountain range stretched on for endless miles in front of me. Creosote and sagebrush scents dried my nose as a tall shadow appeared over the hole I dug. The unknown man had a gun in his left hand, but it was not pointed at me yet. Marine Corps Sergeant Lawson, the stranger said, I'm Navy SEAL Commander Joseph Card. Pleased to meet you. I dropped my shovel and squinted upwards. A special warfare insignia seal trident pin glimmered on the lapel of Card's shirt. I wondered if I could disarm him. It was a tactical disadvantage that he was above ground while I was six feet under. There was no way of reversing roles in the fight, and I did not have intentions of making that ditch my place of burial. Not my name, I said. I resumed my work and tightened the grip on the handle and dug the end of the shovel into the earth. I know it is, he said. You're the only one with that ink job. The tattoo he had referred to was on my right bicep and it read Saint, a dead sinner revised and edited. If you'll excuse me, I said, I have more holes to dig. People around here have to bury their loved ones. Tomorrow's a busy day for the cemetery. I need your service. I know your kill count. You've helped this country. They used to call you the spreader of death. I threw the shovel into the wall of muck and looked up at him while wiping sweat off my forehead. I'm out of the service, I said. If I wanted to go on another mission I would have re-enlisted. This isn't for the government. I'm offering you a chance to do something good and make a fortune at the same time. Are you interested? No. You're wasting talent. You were born to save people and stop threats. This type of work is honorable, I said as I pointed at the shovel. It's practical. I don't kill, I honor the dead now. It's grueling, thankless and doesn't pay. Come with me. Time is finite. Card bent down and extended his hand to help out. No, I said. I grabbed the handle again and proceeded to dig. Card raised the gun. It was a tranquilizer device. I had seen the design before in Afghanistan. The barrel had a syringe spring out from the end of it along with a burst of brightness. A stinging sensation swelled on my neck. Dizziness overcame my vision as my eyelids grew heavy. I picked up the shovel and threw it at Card before he dodged it. You'll thank me in four hours, he said. Blackness covered the sky and swallowed my world. I woke up in a chair. Fatigue enveloped my body. My sight became clearer and I looked around. I was in front of a wooden table. Monochrome walls with expansive windows overlooked grassy plains. A wide theater-sized screen was at the end of the air-conditioned room. Card moved towards where I sat and handed me a jug of blue Gatorade. I nodded at him in, thanks, much too tired to show the malice I felt, and took a long gulp. Don't try to fight once you're hydrated, Card said. I didn't want to sedate you, but time is running out. Sit back and listen to the mission details. Remember, I'm trying to help you get rich. Where am I? Westover Hills, an older sounding man said. Texas. 
I stared in the direction of the echoing and unfamiliar voice. It originated from an individual in a suit and tie who sat at the end of the slab. A diamond-studded watch was on his wrist and he had a mop of slicked back gray hair. There were four other men around the table. They wore casual dress shirts and pants. Their tattoos and demeanors gave them away as blue-collar veterans. I could tell some were also not brought there by choice. My name is Howard LaSalle, the man said as he stood up and walked near the forefront of the table. I know you've all had run-ins with Mr. Card, so I'll skip his introduction. The four of us looked at each other. The Howard LaSalle from Forbes? One of the grunts said. The billionaire Howard LaSalle? That's me. Pay attention to what Card has to say. Card cleared his throat while he stood in front of the screen, a remote control in his hand. Welcome, the SEAL said. Everyone, meet our newest guest, Keith Lawson. He's a valiant Marine Corps sergeant. He's been on special operations in Afghanistan. He was part of Enduring Freedom and other classified missions. I never took compliments well. I nodded at the group around the table. Also meet Josue Morales, an army ranger enlisted for many years. He hunted Noriega in the jungles of Panama as part of Operation Just Cause. Morales nodded. He looked younger than his actual age, but his stare reflected his time on the front lines. Meet Anthony Dryden, someone who's done work as a TF for years and has been a combat rescue officer in the Air Force. Dryden wore a black and white Jack Daniels ball cap. He pulled out a can of wintergreen tobacco chew and placed the dip in the side of his mouth. Meet Matthew Hain. Hain began his military career as an EOD. He became a member of Devgrew. He has participated in acts of counter-terrorism. Hain had the look in his eyes of someone who wanted to get on with the details. Mr. LaSalle's daughter's kidnapped in Mexico, Card said. Her name is Victoria. She is a popular YouTube blogger. Vlogger, LaSalle said, with a V. Right, Card said. Her boyfriend Robert Lucas tagged along with her on their trip. Their goal was to film various locales down there. They were what the youth call urbex filmmakers. They were searching for an abandoned temple. According to lore, it is a place where the dead get rehydrated and fed to snakes thirsty for blood. It's known in legend as the Templo de Pucan. A place of ancient artifacts and dangerous creatures. I don't think it exists, but they did. During their search, they bribed tourist guides to try and get to it. They ran into some lethal people called Entre Los Scorpions. This translates to among the scorpions. They are one of the most vicious cartels in that region. This is their emblem. Card clicked a button on the device. The screen lit up behind him with an image of a gold ring resting on the back of a scorpion with a razor-sharp stinger. Card clicked the device again, and a picture of a woman holding an AK-47 came up. She had hair black as a well of ink. She wore a sand-colored bulletproof vest with another weapon slung over her shoulder. Their leader earned the nickname Devorador de Almas, the Soul Devourer, pictured here. Her real name is Alessia Bakkerin. We have confirmed Lucas is dead. They are threatening to end Victoria's life. They told Mr. LaSalle they would return his daughter for a price. They now want $3 billion. I have a lot of money, LaSalle said while his eyes darkened, but not that amount. So, you all are the help chosen to retrieve her. I picked each one of you for a very specific purpose. I went down to Xochimilco alone before deciding a train team was necessary. I discovered film in a cave Lucas hidden before capture. Card turned around and began playing the found footage. Victoria and Robert laughed in the first scene. They walked down the lanes of Mercado Merced and Mercado Sonora. They went into street markets in Mexico between rows of flea shop stands. They went into an occult bazaar with mason jars, voodoo dolls, spirit boards and candles. A man wearing robes and rings on every finger gazed up at them as they entered. Where can we find the Templo de Pucan? Robert asked. The shaman gave them directions to an outer borough of Mexico City. The two took a riverboat. The famous island of dolls were there. The miniature mannequins hung in the trees. Their burnt plastic bodies were beneath a wooden sign. Spray-painted words designated the area as off-limits. A jump cut in the film occurred. They stood at the mouth of a cave. A scream erupted. It was victorious. 
a gun's muzzle showed up on the right-hand side of the camera view, and a black-gloved hand wrapped around Robert's throat. The camera fell to the ground and the screen went black. Card clicked again. A photograph of a large mansion made of clay surrounded by fertile green land came up. This is our target, Card said. We infiltrate, take out any threats, and question for more info. Bakarin's group resides here when they're not taking hostages or invading villages. Someone inside knows Victoria's location. We can be there by tomorrow. Let's eat, drink, and rest tonight. We save her life after sunup. Two million dollars each if you bring Victoria back alive, LaSalle said. The chopper you'll be traveling in has anti-radar. A picture of Victoria LaSalle came up on the screen. She was 22 years old. I looked at the image of the young woman. I thought of her callow worldview. Her inherent trust of people and the online gold rush of fame led to her kidnapping. I still believe that the situation she was in was undeserving. Despite how much I disliked the way Card drafted me, I felt I still had to help. If it was only in remembrance of the girl's spirit by exacting revenge, it would be worth it. We leave tomorrow morning, Card said. Your lodging for the night is down the hall. What kind of gear are we getting? Morales asked. You'll see. We left the boardroom. I know the de Vorador de Almos, Morales said. We walked down a hallway with windows which overlooked a golf course. Morales looked straight ahead. His eyes seemed to peer on into forever before he continued. She has killed some of my family. I can't wait to squeeze life out of her. Stepping onto the four-bladed, navy-style Black Hawk chopper made me feel at home. It sat on a black and yellow painted helipad built onto a piece of land owned by LaSalle. The smell of sweat and exhaust bombarded us when we went into the chopper. The pilot ignored us and focused on the controls of the dashboard. My boots landed on the floor's ringlets and pipes locked for stretchers and extra seats. I buckled up. The open back cargo area held our weaponry. We were all carrying USB.45 tactical handguns with threaded barrels and suppressors. Our primary weapon of choice was the M14 SOCOM or AK-47Ts. In the incident of a firefight, we would be able to reload by stripping the combatants' bodies of ammunition. It was the same as what the cartel carried. Our body armor was Class 3 of plates made of carbon fiber. Bow fang radios were on our belts alongside our holsters. We carried four grenades each. I had a World War II era K-Bar. Some of the others carried SOG seal pub blades and benchmade knives. In the back of the chopper were six old Soviet rocket-propelled grenade launchers. There were also mounts, multi-tools, and attachable advanced optical combat gun sights, a COGS. I donned bracers which kept my blades secure and within easy reach beneath the long sleeves of my top. It took less than a minute for the Black Hawk to enter the air. The planes below were specs. The houses resembled motionless ants. Some of us were still assembling our guns as we drifted in the atmosphere. We are going to scout the mansion, Card said. We do recon after stalking the premises. If we find the target, we take her in for questioning. Remember how this is a rescue mission. We neutralize threats only when left with no other choice. I looked over at Morales. He pulled out a key chain and stared at it. It had a scorpion frozen in a block of amber attached to the metal pieces. I kept my head down as we passed the outlines of cathedrals, colleges, and museums in Mexico City. Their earthen-tinged buildings reflected the clouds and sunlight. There were estates the size of city blocks surrounded by gates below. We kept ourselves fed with protein bars and water as we neared a stretch of land filled with rivers. The landscape resembled a labyrinth of cracked dirt a child had spilled a bucket of water over. The Black Hawk landed on a hillside facing a field of legumes and different varieties of grass. Card ordered us off, and we began running along the mound. We marched for half a mile before the mansion came into view. Elevated walls with marble slats formed a canopy above a terrace and swimming pool. Black framed windows and roof gardens held verdant plant life. Gapala shrubberies lined the outskirts of two different courtyards. One was in the front and back. Both had white and pink tiles which looked as though they had been dug out from a holy structure and brought there. Beige beams and silver railings encircled a dark wooden spiral staircase. This was visible from where we were because of the absence of glass. 
a statue stood next to the swimming pool. It looked like Lady Justice. Instead of scales she held a snake in one hand and a severed head in the other. Do you know what that statue is? I asked Morales. The dope god Ola Kun, he said. She is always carried by the cartel. Get down, Card said. We laid flat on our stomachs and took cover behind a row of bushes. We peered through the sights of our sniper rifles. Card pulled out a pair of infrared binoculars. Lots of scorpions there, he said. Remember, the less engagement the better. We'll wait here all night for Alessia if we have to. I looked out at the rear courtyard. Two men walked. One was a scorpion. His uniform was normal for the group. He had on beige khakis, a tactical overcoat and an AK-47. He was pointing his weapon at the second man, who was in his 70s. The old man's hands were behind his back as the scorpion prodded him along. He kicked the hostage in the back of the knees. The elder dropped, and the scorpion aimed the rifle at his head. The scorpion hit the old man with the butt of the weapon and made him squirm. I aimed at the scorpion's kill zone. I squeezed the trigger. A crimson trail floated from the hostel as he fell to the ground. Shouting flared up. Seven scorpions flooded out of the estate. Dryden picked off two of them in a matter of seconds as I shot another. Circle the perimeter, Card yelled. Morales, stay on Lawson 6 and take the right. Dryden, take the front courtyard and stick with Hain. I'll get around to the back and start clearing the house. We don't want them calling reinforcements. We sprinted towards the mansion. A member fired shots at us as we took cover behind a marble block behind potted plants. Bullets chewed through the stone as I returned fire. Morales unsheathed his sog blade, stood up when the fire had ceased, and threw it. The knife landed in the enemy's eyes. His body tumbled back as he continued to unleash a spray of lead everywhere. The back of his skull cracked open with the impact of the fall. Advance, Morales shouted. We moved further up to an overhang supported by clay beams. A member fired shots at us from the inside. Morales was thrust backwards in the air. I squeezed the trigger at the opening. I whipped around and scanned the area for advancing movements. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine, Morales said while standing up. The bullet must have hurt, but his vest protected him. We trailed along the western side of the house. We glanced around the corner to see Hain evade a chucked Molotov before it burst. Hain shot the man who had tried to kill him. The smell of fuel was pungent in the air as his combatant's lifeless form buckled. Hain kicked in the door and entered the place. We followed behind him, our guns at the ready. The main foyer had a large spiral staircase and an open area which resembled a hotel lobby. Three waited for us. Hain's armor got hit as he executed the first attacker. Morales took out the secondary. The third unloaded a round at us as I shot him in the arm. His gun dropped and he fell to the tile. He unsheathed the hatchet, stood up and ran towards me with a wail. I gave him two rounds to the neck before he went limp and face planted. Card's voice rang out, grenade. We went to the ground and covered our ears. An explosion rocked the eastern side of the mansion. Debris showered us. We concealed our faces from the cloud of destruction as best we could. Card came down from the blitz staircase, dragging two bodies with him. He threw them down to our level as he leapt over the railing. Dust and gore blanketed him. Take what they have and reload, he said. It's clear from the bottom up. We have the basement left to search. Go. Our commander pointed at an oak wooden door swung open in the far left corner. I was in the front of the group. I turned on the flashlight attached to my scope. I descended a rickety old staircase to the subterranean part of the narco mansion. Card was closest to my side with the others following. We entered a Baroque-style wine cellar. Copper plates hung on the walls. Shelves with carved drawings on their oak held long rows of bottles. A scorpion jumped out from behind a wood barrel. I grabbed his arm and broke his wrist and slammed my hand into his solar plexus. He doubled over and I gave him a knee to the face. I grabbed the back of his head, swept his feet out from under him and placed him in a rear naked choke. Card tapped me on the shoulder. Don't kill him, he said. Let him go. He might have some answers we need. He's the only one left alive. I released him and stood up. Card had Morales translate his questions into Spanish. 
Where is the Soul Devourer? Where is Victoria LaSalle? The Scorpion spat on Card. Card pulled out his handgun and shot the man in the left knee. Tell him that he'll be wheelchair bound for the rest of his life unless he starts talking, Card said to Morales. The man began crying as Morales repeated the words. He says that there is a map leading to where they are, Morales said. The Templo de Pucan. It's in the head of the Ola Kuhn statue near the pool. Retrieve it, Card said after facing me. Dryden, you go with him. I went up the basement steps and out towards the pool. I passed piles of bodies. At least 20 scorpions lay dead. A fire was burning the ground on the other side of the mansion from the throne Molotov. The old man who was a former hostage of the first scorpion I shot it was lying down, bleeding but alive. I cut the restraints binding his wrists. I gave him an MRE and advised him to go home. He thanked me and went into the desert. I approached the Olokun statue. I drove my K-bar into the head she held. I slipped my black gloves on. I dug my fingers into the hollow interior and pulled out a thick piece of brown parchment covered in grime. Morales stared at the map after Card grabbed it. He unfolded it on the surface of a table in the cellar. We let the scorpion go after Dryden administered aid to him in the form of a tourniquet. We gave him a fractured beam to use as a walking stick. I helped him up the stairs and brought him to the edge of the property. We made sure he did not have a cell phone or radio. I wished him good luck as he hobbled away. I knew the environment, coupled with the severity of his injuries, was going to take his life. This does point to the Templo de Pucan, Morales said. That can't be right. The temple is a myth. It's a place destroyed during a war between rival Mayan kingdoms in the 5th century. We're about to see if it's real or not, I said. I reloaded my AK-47. We sat in the back of the Black Hawk, flying through the air in a direction using the map's coordinates. Morales took off his vest and revealed bruising around his ribs. I gave him my vest since his got damaged. I went into the back and retrieved a new one. Your tattoo, Morales said. Who wrote it? Ambrose Bierce, I said. It's the definition of a saint from his book The Devil's Dictionary. What does it do for you? It reminds me how nobody's perfect. Keeps me from self-loathing. Thanks for what you did back there, Morales said. What you did back there was hot-headed, Card said. Good job to the rest of the team for dealing with the jarhead's mistake. I took the criticism, aware the firefight started with me trying to do the fair thing and saving an old man's life. Straight on, the pilot shouted. We stared. It can't be. Morales said. A moss-covered pyramid made of old stones came into view on the horizon. It was the ancient building seen in countless historic drawings. I thought of human sacrifices painted blue and brought to the top. My mind could not escape the image of their hearts eaten by a predatory god. The sun lowered. The black hawk landed on a neighboring hill covered in grass. We jumped out and took position on a precipice. We crouched and stared through our sights and night vision binoculars. Oh my god, Dryden said as he squinted through his acog. Are you seeing this? There was a campfire, tents, and bodies in the distance. The corpses looked starved. They in rows, as if they were about to be burnt or buried. They all wore the scorpion uniform. A figure walked past them. I recognized her. I found Alessia, I said. We take her alive, Card said as he pulled out the same tranquilizer gun he had used on me a day and a half ago. She knows where Victoria is. Is anyone else with her? The dead, Dryden said. We're heading in, Card said. Maintain concealment. We approach the pyramid. The sounds of rattling snakes and the smell of rotting flesh wafted towards us with each step. We crouched low in the bushes within 15 feet of the soul devourer. A hatchet flew by my head. A net wrapped around my body. Card pulled out his gun and fired. A masked scorpion ran near me, and while I wanted to shoot, the net constricted my body and I could not lift my weapon. He hit me upside the head with the butt of his AK. I lost consciousness. I woke up. Everything came into focus like an image in a microscope. I heard arguing in Spanish. Looking over with my wrists tied in vines, I saw Morales hung upside down from a palm tree. Right by his side were Dryden and Card bound in the same way. Most of our gear was gone. I felt my knives were still intact, but there was no way of using them. 
Alessia smiled at us as a campfire's flames roared behind her. Next to Alessia was a folded out briefcase lined with hacksaws, rods, pliers and needles. Where is Victoria? I yelled at her. The soul devourer laughed and walked towards me. She reached out and grabbed my jaw. She leaned in close enough to kiss me. They're inside, she said, pointing to the mouth of the pyramid. See all those bodies? She gestured to the men drained of blood. Alessia pulled what looked like the front of a human skull, with two bands near the back. It resembled a Dio de los Muertos fashion item. Leathery snake skin wrapped around the bone matter. Victoria's lover is the one responsible for this, Alessia said. We didn't kill him for sport, we did it for vengeance. Do you even know what the pukins are, gringo? Shapeshifters. Creatures able to take different forms. The boy wandered around the temple one night when we fell asleep after he tried to escape. He found the mask, one we knew as sacred, but his ignorance cost him and us everything. He decided to put it on and he resurrected them. Victoria is about to become a feast for the pukins. My men were as well after her foolish boyfriend fell victim to his own curiosity. You are soon to be, also. Ares Unipera Tonta, Morales said. Pinche Pero, she said after walking towards him. You'll be the first one I torture. Morales brought his hands down. A knife slid from one of his bracers. He cut the vines which imprisoned him. He dug the knife into Alessia's forehead. She slumped to the earth. He bent upwards and cut the bindings on his feet before landing on his back. The same guard who had knocked me out unleashed a spurt of bullets at the escaped ranger, who pivoted to the side. Morales grabbed a beretta off Alessia's belt and ended the scorpion's life with a shot to the chest. He cut the rest of his team members down from the bindings. Card had a black eye, Dryden had a scrape on his forehead, and Hain looked exhausted. We retrieved our gear from their tents and put on our combat attire again. You heard her, Card said as he motioned to the mouth of the pyramid. Victoria's in there. Let's go. What about the pukins? Dryden asked. You know, the shapeshifters brought back to life? You believe in old wives' tales? Card asked. Olesia was trying to scare us. Dryden stared at the seal. I don't see how these men could have had blood removed from their bodies, sir. It doesn't add up. Not our problem, Card said. Focus on the goal at hand. We've all seen worse and you know it. Let's go in. Dryden nodded, and we went into the temple. There was a long corridor with a floor made of stone blocks. The first few walls were heaps of ancient mortar. Once we were in a larger area with hung torches which lit the way, we walked on hollow ground. The Mayan interior had stucco friezes. Depictions of human figures lined the barriers. They had elaborate bird headdresses, jade jewels, and each one sat cross-legged. Ceramic vessels were on the shelves against the walls. Glyphs of goddesses with snake heads and other deified rulers of an age long gone greeted us. We went into another chamber. A wooden funerary mask with emerald beaded teeth hung in the center and gazed down at us in warning. In the next hall, there were holes in the ceiling. Fluorescence from the moon and stars pierced through them as beams. Obelisks lined up like an Aztec Stonehenge. Victoria was in the middle of the room. She wore a white top and black cargo pants given to her by the cartel caked in blood. She was staring at the ceiling and looked at me as I approached. She was bound to one of the pillars. I cut the ropes. Your father sent us to save you, Card said. They, she said. Who's they? Morales asked. They're coming for us. The sound of hissing filled the room. Something moved to my left. When I turned with my gun aimed, I saw Dryden lifted off his feet and carried towards the ceiling. His form floated through the beams of light. He screamed, released a few shots, and vanished. The remaining four of us pointed our guns up. Dryden fell back down to the ground. He was pale, thin, and devoid of blood, like the men who were out front. His breathing had ceased. The thing swooped down. It was a serpent the size of a battering ram used to tear down doors on medieval castles. Two black leather wings outstretched on either side. The wings had sharp tips laced through it like sticks used to hold a kite together. Card pulled out his knife and slashed at the monster. The stringy and fibrous gliding implements tore. Blood spurted from it onto his clothes. 
Hain came up from behind and tried to climb onto its back, but its body was too slick. I ran up to Hain. I climbed onto his shoulders and leapt onto the creature's back. I yelled out a battle cry and emptied a clip into the pukin's head after pointing the gun straight down. It fell forward like a slinky. I landed on my side and slid from its flesh. Card grabbed Victoria's hand, and ran towards the entranceway after motioning for us to do the same. We followed at a sprint. One of the beasts slithered out of the shadows as fast as a vehicle going full speed. Its body writhed with serpentine movements towards us. Its wings folded onto its form with tightening muscles. Its body locked up to spring at us as grotesque noises echoed in the chamber. Card pulled the pin on his grenade and threw it into the creature's mouth. It exploded in a cloud of entrails as we continued running. Another pukin followed behind it. As the third one neared us, it began to change its own form, mutating. I was not eager to find out what shape it would take next. I lobbed a grenade behind me as we went outside. The creature's head made it to the threshold of the mouth of the pyramid. Morales turned around and began shooting at the eyes. The creature's tongue lashed out and hit him in the knees, and its gaze burrowed into him. Morales' gun dropped as his body froze and began seeping out blood in front of me. The red fluid soaked into the earth and gushed towards the fangs of the monster. I lobbed more grenades until my belt was empty. I reached for Morales' belt and retrieved his key chain and another bomb. I threw it at the pukin. We ran over the row of dead scorpions. Victoria tripped over Alessia's body. I helped pick her up, and we continued to run. The base of the pyramid was the first to get wiped out by the blasts. The rest fell as if a hurricane had wreaked havoc. The stones tumbled down onto the creature's body, halting its advance. Morales got buried with it in a maelstrom of fragmented rock. We ran up the hill and jumped into the Black Hawk. It was two minutes before Victoria was secure in a chair and we lifted off the ground. As we ascended, I looked down and saw more slithering forms. I wished I could go back and retrieve Morales and Dryden to give them the proper burials they deserved. I grabbed an RPG from the back, leveled it, took in a deep breath and fired a missile at both of the snakes. The targets evaporated in flames. The palm trees, bodies and blocks of granite became engulfed in an inferno below. The blaze and debris rose as an angry storm before it all collapsed back down. The mission was successful, Card said. We did it. Good job, men. We remained silent for hours after as the desert landscape passed beneath us. The keychain Morales had kept stared back at me. The scorpion frozen in amber. I decided to pocket it as a keepsake, a remembrance of the man who served by my side. We were soon over the border and back into the United States. My dad sent you? Victoria asked. We all nodded. Alessia told me my father's been funding money for rival cartels in this region, Victoria said. She stared out at the night sky before she continued, he's involved in arms deals down here for terrible people. He always told me his money came from oil. He lied. They didn't take me hostage with the hopes of making money, they did it to torment him. None of us said a word. Victoria reached into one of the side pockets of her cargo pants and pulled out the Mayan skull mask. The very object which had caused the rift between what we recognized as real and the unknown. The item which had allowed those beasts to escape from their world of sleep, their nests. This made me feel alive when I was wearing it, Victoria said. It made Lucas feel amazing, too. It brings out a sense of godliness. Have the three of you ever felt anything like that? I pulled out my 45 and shot the mask. A fog filled the inside of the chopper, emanating from the remaining pieces which rained down on us. I kicked what landed on the ground out of the compartment to the nether sands. Howard LaSalle's mansion came into view as Victoria screamed at us. Creepy at first. Ended in a face palm. I was a young sergeant in 2006 stationed at Fort Bliss. Right outside of Fort Bliss was a training area that was near Biggs Airfield. We were guarding some equipment overnight so the company wouldn't have to stay. It was me and one private. I told him he would take shifts patrolling and since we were allowed to have cars out there the other would nap in his car. I woke up to my soldier knocking on my window in a complete panic. It scared me at first. Private, Sergeant. Wake up, 
There's UFOs out here. Me. What? Private points in the direction and sure as shit I see these lights that seemed like they were floating around and then disappearing. Took me a moment as I had just woken up. That's the Franklin Mountain Range. You're looking at the cars driving on the scenic route. The cars would be visible and then disappear when they went around the corner of a turn only to appear again when they came back around. I was very agitated at first but the next day it was by far the funniest experience I had in the military. We wrote it off as some of the instructors messing with us but while training at JWTC, there was a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night. Definitely sounded like a woman. The lieutenant in charge made us do a quick accountability check then he started radioing the training center to see what the hell happened. The instructors went out from their compound, did some checks but didn't find anything. They said it's not the first time they had units out there calling in to report the same thing. Is a dude vanishing spooky enough? I was on one rooftop on post with another marine and on the building next to mine was a dude smoking a cigarette. I looked to my partner to mention it but when we looked again he was gone. The roof access door for that building was very rusty and loud so there's no way he snuck out in those few seconds it took to get my partner's attention. Not my story, so I'll tell it as best I can. This happened during a rotation at the National Training Center sometime in 2015. A battle was occurring at night, a light appeared in the sky and for 10 minutes or so there was silence. This may not seem too interesting until you look at the numbers and statistics, you're looking at massive amounts of people and equipment during a rotation, constant radio chatter, vehicle noise, people talking, etc. And suddenly just nothing. Then the light seemed to make a couple strange turns, one being around 90 degrees, and split and disappear. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.